I call this pre-meeting briefing of the Carrollton Farms franchise, the Board of Trustees to order at 6.01 p.m. on November 1st, 2018. The purpose of this pre-meeting briefing is to conduct a briefing session with administrative staff regarding the posted agenda for the regular board meeting scheduled for 7 p.m. on November 1st, 2018. For the record, Tara Herbacek, Sally Derrick, Randy Shackman, and Candace Valenzuela and myself are here. Um, so our first item is briefing session with the administrative staff regarding the posted agenda for the regular board meeting schedule for 7 p.m. Board members, do you have any questions regarding consent agenda items? Mr. Shackman? Um, not so much a question. I want to pull item 4D uh, so that we, with open meeting, can have a brief, I don't mean for it to be long, uh, discussion as the board uh, potentially to request some reports for down the road. I will then go ahead and approve and, and make a motion for us to approve it as it was submitted, but would like to get that open discussion out into the meeting. Okay, any other? Mr. Vatic? Um On the district and campus improvement plans, so questions on content, do we want We're to pull that to talk have a about it? presentation in okay. a minute. We will. Okay. And time allowing. So time allowing. We'll get to it. Okay, that's what that means. Okay. <laughs> we'll not eat. <laughs> okay. Just, just okay. Anybody else? So with that, we'll move to number three, reports by administration, Dr. Chapman. Yes, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I will turn over to Ms. Tillman uh, for consent agendas I through N regarding financials. Thank you. This evening, we would like to provide you with brief briefing and background, background information on these items. Um, these are standard items that we present every year to the Board of Trustees. There's no substantial change to these items, but we do want to provide you with the background. The short version is that our number one priority related to investing district funds is the safety of those funds. These are taxpayer dollars, and although we are able to invest under the Public Funds Investment Act in many things, we choose to be very restrictive and very conservative with how we invest those funds because these are taxpayer dollars. And so we are not going to go out for the highest interest rates potentially um, because we don't want that risk um, with these dollars. That's the short version. Um, Mr. Roderick's here and he's gonna go through each item very quickly just to remind you um, what the requirements are for those items and to give you an opportunity to ask questions. Thank you. Uh, the Public Funds Investment Act establishes requirements that must be completed by the district. Uh, these six agenda items tonight uh, satisfy those requirements. Uh, the first one is 4M. Uh, the Public Funds Investment Act requires the district to review and approve the investment policy and investment strategy not less than once per year. Uh, CDA Legal is actually the Public Funds Investment Act and CDA local is what we call investment strategies. Uh, these are items that are further defined by the district, uh, such as investments can be, uh, we can invest in things that have a maturity up to two years. Uh, the, also district provides that we have to uh, uh, provide an annual report as well as the quarterly reports. And our, like, like Ms. Tillman said, our main focus is safety and liquidity of our funds. Uh, the next item is 4K. It require, the Public Funds Investment Act requires the district to annually adopt the list of qualified broker dealers that are authorized to engage in investment transactions with the district. Um, there are no changes with any broker dealers. Uh, uh, we haven't been buying a lot from broker dealers lately. Uh, we were previously buying some CDs, but because of the interest rates have been going up, uh, we can get uh, a good bang for our buck with uh, just money market funds. And so we've kind of um, got away from buying CDs. Uh, the next item is 4L. It requires the district to appoint uh, investment officers to be responsible for the investments funds of the consistent with the adopted investment policy. Um, there are no changes to our investment officers. Uh, they are Tanya Tillman, uh, Vicki Pippen, uh, Michelle Cease, and myself. Uh, and the next item is 4N. Uh, it requires approval of independent sources of instruction to, um, to obtain investment officer training. Um, the sources are the Center of Public Management from UNT, uh, Texas Society of CPAs, Region 10, TASBO, uh, North Central Texas Council of Governments, and TexPool. And then the, then the last two items are items 4I and 4J. 
4i. 4i is the annual investment report, and 4j is the quarterly investment report. Um, the Public Funds Investment Act requires officers to prepare and submit to the governing body a written report of investment transactions. Um, like, a, like we've previously said, the Public Funds Investment Act requires us to report quarterly uh, in our investment strategies. Uh, also requires us to do an annual report. Uh, most of our funds are in text pool. Um, um, we become more and more dependent on our property taxes, and so we need to be more liquid in August, uh, September, and October before our, um, uh, before our tax revenues um, become due for the, pre for the current year. Um, <clears throat> we also expect, uh, um, with meetings we've had with different financial advisors, uh, we expect interest rates to maybe just at least maybe four times before the end of 2019, so we don't want to invest in something long-term uh, with the money markets, we'll, we want to um, get uh, most uh, benefit from those rising interest rates. Um, some of the items that you might see in our, in our investment report is we have uh, $35 million in Wells Fargo. It's a government uh, money market fund, uh, very similar to Tex Pool. Uh, we also have $15 million in Legacy Texas. Uh, that is an investment that uh, it's a money market that pays 10 basis a point, 10 basis points above Tex Pool. Um, they adjust that rate daily, and then we also have $15 million with Dallas Capital Bank, um, and that pays. Uh, that's an investment that started um, this month, I believe. Uh, and it pays 10 basis above uh, text pool as well. And so we're very happy uh, with those, uh, those um, that way we can diversify. And then going into 1819, um, we want to uh, diversify a little bit away from text pool. Not that it's bad, we just want to diversification in your fund, uh, with your funds is always a good idea. So uh, those are a very quick overview of the investment um, items that are on tonight's consent agenda. Board members, are there any questions for regarding the financial items? Just a, a comment, Mrs. Klein. Uh, one of the things that we have encountered as we are out presenting information about the bond is some questions about how we can uh, achieve what we're doing without raising the tax rate. And I uh, just think it is amazing what you all have done with our funds, the safety and security of those funds, and helping to bring advice to us uh, to defease bonds at different times and to work with different strategies that have maximized the fiscal efficiency of this district to the point that we're doing what we're doing. And so uh, kudos to all who are in our finance office and all of you who work on that because you really do take great care of the students and the district and makes us as a board look good. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. I think we all agree. <laughs> Any other questions? So with that, Dr. Chapman? Yes, at this time we'd like to pull consent item C. Uh, in district and campus improvement plans, Dr. Warnock. Sure, thank you, Dr. Chapman. Uh, members of the board, it's my honor to introduce you to Mai Williams. Uh, he is the chairperson of our DIC and he is going to kick off our presentation tonight. Um, good evening, uh, Ms. Klein, Dr. Chapman, members of the board. I am Mai Williams. I'm the chairperson of the District Improvement Council and a teacher at Los Colinas Elementary. Um, tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce the district plan. The district has one goal and every CFB team member from staff to students knows the goal, high achievement for each student. This singular focus allows us to align our professional development, our resources and efforts towards the goal. We believe in a relentless pursuit of our goal. There are, there are four guiding objectives that guide us to achieving this goal. The district aligns major strategies to the guiding objectives and sets targets each year to ensure we are making progress toward the goal. We want to 
continuously improve student learning, continuously improve the learning environment, continuously improve operational effectiveness, and continuously improve community support. So we have a three-year plan, and each year we gather stakeholder feedback and make adjustments to the three-year plan, and then present the current year to the Board of Trustees for approval. The DIC has made revisions and changes to the plan, and we present the final version of the 2018-2019 plan tonight. The District Improvement Council serves as an advisory board to the superintendent. We meet six times per year to review and revise the district plan, to review the school calendar, and to give feedback to the administration on a variety of issues related to the planning and operations of the school district. The DIC is comprised of a representative <coughs> from each campus as well as business and community leaders. And at this time, I will turn the presentation to Dr. Warnock. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, it's my pleasure to talk a little bit about our objective one strategies to help move forward the student learning. Um, under that, we have uh, improvement of the instructional core, improving feedback and observation, improving data-informed decision-making, and then increasing innovative programming, including our digital learning. For improvement of the instructional core, some of our major tactics that we have to move that forward are our work with instructional rounds. We have a district problem of practice and we have instructional rounds networks at elementary, middle, and high school where we go in and study uh, classroom instruction and help to make next level of work for the campus. And we also continue to refine our curriculum uh, to build relevancy and to address the needs of our students. We've rolled out Canvas, which is a learning management system, uh, and are working to have accessible curriculum anywhere, anytime for teachers. And then we also have a coaching infrastructure in place to help support new and veteran teachers to grow their teaching skills. We uh, provide support for principals, directors, and coaches, ultimately for those people to support teachers in improving what happens in the classroom with the teacher's knowledge and skills, the student, and the level and rigor of content. To improve feedback and observation, we have a coaching infrastructure at uh, all three levels, elementary, middle, and high, that we use our title funds to provide uh, resources for most of that coaching infrastructure and we have a process called leverage leadership that really gives everybody regular cycles of observation and feedback improving data informed decision making last year we invested in the measures of academic progress it's a nationally normed test and we're giving that at grades k through nine previously we were giving it at three through eight and we expanded that because it really allows us the best tool to track student growth and gives us very focused, deliberate uh, moves we can make in small group instruction with students. We've also shifted to have cumulative-based assessments in adjusting our curriculum based on student performance data, um, and then getting that data at the classroom level for teachers to take action on it. And then finally, uh, increasing our innovative program, including our digital learning. Uh, we have had the opening of our stellar programs this year in STEM and fine arts, uh, expanded our full day pre-K program to two additional campuses. And then we are in our pilot uh, second year of our pay for pre-K program and have seen increased enrollment there. We have expanded our dual language at uh, Tulong Middle School. And then we have also gone one-to-one -one, uh, our second year at middle schools, our first year at high schools. We use multiple measures in order to, um, you know, continue to measure our progress related to objective one. So first and foremost, we look at our state accountability rating. We were in 87, which was a high B this year for our accountability rating. We also look at our ERG district performance index um, coupled with the accountability rating. We look uh, at additional metrics, including dual credit, advanced course completion, uh, our elementary students reading on grade level at K one and two. We know that's critical for third grade literacy rates, uh, student perception data about academic rigor and student progress as measured by the uh, MAP test discussed earlier. 
We also look at our percentage of students meeting our what's called CCMR, career, college, and military readiness factors, uh, the earning uh, career and technology certificates and licensures, as well as the participation of students in fine arts and athletics and their performance, as well as SAT and ACT participation and performance. Our second objective is to improve the learning environment and our number one priority is to ensure student safety and security uh, and this board has made a real commitment in that and uh, we'll see some additional discussion tonight from uh, for the board regarding how we continue to increase our safety and security. We also believe that improving the learning environment is about meeting students' physical and emotional needs. Just a few of the strategies that we've put in place here are partnering with outside entities such as children's to provide telehealth services at high schools, expanding that to middle schools for counseling support and for medical needs at pilot campuses, building practices around restorative discipline, teaching internet safety, providing supportive intervention strategies both academically and behaviorally, conducting our time which is a um, community building and character building conversation at all elementary schools and continuing to build positive classroom culture. We'll turn it over to Mr. Finley to discuss the effective learning facility. Thank you Dr. Warnock. As everyone is aware we initiated and completed both a comprehensive facility assessment as well as a safety and security assessment and we're using the data from both of those instruments to develop and refine our overall building improvement program. These ass assessments also form the foundation of one of the district's primary efforts this year, which was the development and call of a bond election. And this election, as again everyone knows, touches every educational facility in the district. And just to remind everyone, the key components of this building program are safety and security, upgrading and renovating our infrastructure at our campuses, technology and major innovations at three campuses. In addition, we have fully integrated the maintenance work order system, and to date, we have processed over 23,000 work orders. And this is an important piece because we're using this data also uh, to determine the needed areas of efficiency, staffing, and overall organization and improvement within the operations department. At this time, we have also obligated the majority of both of our tax increment financing funds, or TIF funds, and we're developing a plan of action for any remaining fund payments that may come available to us. And lastly, we are aligning the operations department priorities with that of the districts in terms of safety and security, customer service, improved maintenance and operations, and overall efficiency. Dr. Warnock. Thank you. We monitor our progress on objective two with several different measurements, including attendance rate. We believe that creating an environment that encourages student attendance is critically important and also we know student attendance is connected to funding for schools. We also review our student and teacher and parent feedback on learning environment collected by our survey instruments annually and we set targets for improvement based on our stakeholder feedback. Additionally, last year we added district facility assessment scores for each building in the district as a measurement. We'll turn it over to Dr. Coleman. Yes, I'm going to address, excuse me, I'm going to address the uh, measures related to improving operational effectiveness and one of those strategies that we have implemented is to improve I'm going to address the the goal related to improving operational effectiveness and one of the strategies that we have developed is to improve human resource management and we all know that to, uh, to uh, have high achievement for each student it means that each student has to have the best teacher possible. We are continuing to monitor our market data to see how it applies to teacher both beginning pay and teacher pay when they have been in our district for at least 15 years. We've become competitive in both those areas and we intend to remain competitive. Recruiting is a very important part of what we do to uh, recruit teachers or to make sure that each child has high achievement and we're using data from recruiting trips from last year to make informed decisions about recruiting during the 18-19 school year. 
That includes looking at the applications, looking at resumes, and then looking at the people who were actually hired this year to see where they came from and then to inform our recruiters about where to go this year. We are also continuing to work with the communications department to brand our district in a way that will make sure we attract the most qualified candidates possible. And we're using social media data too from Facebook advertisements that the communications department is collecting for us. Based on our data related to the need for certified Spanish bilingual teachers and the shortage of applicants, we have made the decision to hire bilingual teachers in advance this year. And beginning, beginning now, as soon as possible, continuing through the spring semester, we're going to hire a, a designated number of teachers who are certified in bilingual education. We're going to offer contracts for them to begin work for the 1920 school year. But in order to keep them associated with us, we're going to offer them substitute teaching positions if we don't have any vacancies, that is, then we'll offer them substitute teaching positions for the spring of uh, 2019. We're working to improve our retention by providing exceptional customer service during every interaction with employees, both internal customers and external customers in the district. We believe this is one of our superintendent's priorities and the personnel department is committed to partnering with the communications department to implement a district-wide customer service initiative called iCare. The um, communications department has been doing a good job of implementing that, but we believe this partnership is making it even more meaningful. Graduates of CFB have a pipeline to return to the district as teachers. Our Future Teacher Promise program began last year with an initial cohort of about 23 students, and we are currently planning events to stay connected with those students. The most recent event is a luncheon on November the 15th, where we have invited as many of those 23 students as possible to return so that we can hear about their experiences. We are also working in a partnership with the Education Services Division to develop dual credit courses, and, I mean to develop CTE courses and a dual credit track for those students. These are some of the things that we're doing to make sure that we improve our human resource management effectiveness and I believe that Ms. Tillman is now going to talk to you about the financial management piece. Under financial management and business practices, we will continue to look for ways to communicate um, with our community in more user-friendly budget and financial reporting documents. We will review our staffing ratios as well as program staffing to determine alignment with identified needs, with our enrollment trends, as well as peer districts. We will, con we will begin the process of working towards developing our 2019 budget that continues to support the priorities identified by the board, our superintendent, and community. Tactical ste steps to improve technology infrastructure and operations include the continuation of upgrades to campus network equipment. In addition, we will continue to expand and enhance our campus wireless access capabilities and continue to investigate ways or options to provide students with wireless access outside of school. We monitor progress in Objective 3 with several performance targets, including the ERG District's Productivity Index. The, product in, the Productivity Index can help identify those districts who are providing the highest relative academic performance at the lowest relative cost per student. It's adjusted for the effects of student demographics and regional cost differences. We also monitor the number of days in fund balance to ensure the district is maintaining adequate reserves for long-term financial stability. Other key targets under Objective 3 we monitor are related to DFW market data for compensation, as well as staff and student survey data. Dr. Warnout will now finish with Objective 4. Thank you. Objective 4 has three main strategies to improve our community support. And the first is to develop a climate of care through our I Care Customer Service Initiative, which includes initial and follow-up training for all of our frontline office staff as well as administrators. 
We know how critical our first interactions are with our customers. We are implementing a continual feedback system to help improve both internal and external customer service. The second strategy is to develop a culture of trust with open and transparent communication through engaging our parents and community with our schools. Some of these tactics include refining our crisis communication protocols, increasing the number of business partnerships, and building our ambassador program. The third strategy is to develop the CFBISD brand awareness and loyalty. We will be focusing marketing in order to recruit new students and staff, as Dr. Coleman shared, as well as retaining our current students and staff. We monitor objective four through survey data on customer service and communications, as well as through data on marketing reach. We also track the number of students and staff that we attract and retain. We know that we have a very rapidly changing world and we have to be flexible um, to adjust in order to stay ahead of the curve. And um, we, we are committed to do that to continuously improve. So that concludes our report and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, board members, are there any questions for staff? So you said you were going to pull this, you're pulling no, this, this is item? No, this is it now. This is it? Uh-huh. Okay, do you, can I just go ahead and ask yes. that we pull this item and then I'll ask my questions in the meeting, is that okay? Can we do that or, or no? Well, it's 6.30, I don't want to hold anybody no, up. Okay. Um, so a couple of questions. Um, well, first a comment. There was uh, in the findings on the district um, plan, um, students' perceptions indicate that they believe the work um, they do in the classroom could increase in rigor. I think that says a lot about our students first. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, what when you all saw that, or when you got from the data, how did that make it onto your finding list, or what? How do you? How is that going to be addressed, or what are the steps? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So that's a youth truth survey question, and the way the question is worded is that the work I do in class really makes me think. Yes, very often, sometimes, or no. And so we want a higher proportion of students to say yes very often. And really the way that we're addressing that is through our instructional rounds work around critical thinking. We're studying Faccioni's book, Think Critically, with all of our principles, and it is the focus of our rounds work. It's our problem of practice. And the, the best way we do that is by improving the questions that we ask students to think about in class. So it's in the discourse moves and the pedagogy in the classroom, and we are intently focused on that. So, um, you know, yesterday we left a campus with their targeted plan of how they're going to increase the level of questioning that we're doing on campus. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then um, that helps. Thank you. Sure. And then, um, sorry, I had to take a picture of my notes because I didn't get to print it out. The, in the plan on some of the metrics on um, map and um, on the mathematics, the drop in mathematics, um, that was a big drop. What, are there any indicators as far as what's contributing to that? Was it our focus on reading? I, I mean, what's, yeah, let me get the, to the plan pulled up. Are you referring specifically to the map? Yeah, I think it, hang on, I, did, I only put mathematics. Let me try to find it, sorry. It's okay. Um, but I think it went from the 60s down into the 50s. On students meeting annual progress? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's, thank you, that's a great question. So um, MAP is nationally normed test, and they set a projection, it's called a RIT score. So when students take the test, um, let's say they scored a 220, they would say, well, a student who scored a 220 should, by next year, have a projected growth of eight points, mm -hmm. okay? So then students might be growing, but they might not hit that eight point. Let's say they got seven points. Okay. then they are not included in the met growth percentage. Nationally, depending on the test, 50 to 60% of the students will meet their annual growth. It doesn't mean others didn't grow. They might not have grown as much as they needed to to hit that target. And so we really look at 
50 to 60 percent and we check and see what was the national average we want to be beating that um so that does that answer your it question does. i mean the fact that um you know, that up to eight might not you know, isn't included in that number and i guess my concern is are we seeing a correlation of these you know, that those numbers in any of the other tests that were true you know star are we seeing drops in stars on math or you know is this we indicative of anything yeah, else we are right now looking at our uh we see a drop in mathematics performance uh, between fifth and sixth grade okay. and so we're really looking at um, what is the gap we have our elementary and our secondary mathematics directors right now investigating what what might be causing this drop we had a shift in our math teaks um, a couple of years ago that required a lot of shift and alignment and pushed upper level content down into lower grades um, and so i think that we are still adjusting uh, with that um, but no, we, we're looking at how we continue to improve our mathematics, particularly at our middle schools. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And then um, last comment is um, I went in, in looking at the campus improvement plans. Um, I, because I had mentioned it last year about increasing community and parent support, um, I, I when I went back and, and looked, there was definite improvement in that, and, and I appreciate that because I think, you know, while sometimes, those, it, it, and I've been in it, you know, it's hard to get to those meetings, and so when you can get um, that imp those people to the meetings, I think it's a really easy way to introduce folks to the good things happening in our schools. And so for the board members in my um, Excel and pivot table fund, um, 31 schools had an increase in non-staff participation, and of those 31, nine schools did it with an increase in staff participation in eight with no change in staff participation. So I think that's um, really indicative of the collaboration between um, parents and community members. And um, the top schools with non-staff um, participation, River Chase, Davis, Good, and Las Colinas, um, again, I think those efforts just promote that collaboration between our community and our families. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Bacek. After the feedback last year, our principals really heard that and took it to heart and have worked hard to increase. Great. So thank Great. you for the feedback. Good. Pass along my thanks. I will, absolutely. I would say if there are any other questions, we can discuss them during the regular meeting. But at this time, I think we can move along unless, does anybody have anything else pressing? Okay, so board members, we've reached the end of the agenda for this pre-meeting briefing and we are adjourned at 6.34 p.m. I call this regular meeting of the Carrollton Farmers Ranch ISD Board of Trustees to order at 7 p.m. on November 1st, 2018. Board members, district staff members, and members of the audience, you are free to join me in standing as Mr. Harold Elias Percival from First Christian Church Carrollton provides a message followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Randy Shackman and the Pledge of the Texas Flag led by Tara Herbacek. Let's all pause to open ourselves. Amazing God, we come before you this day celebrating an opportunity to help serve you and serve the community by lifting up our children, making them a priority, living as if they are a priority. Help us to take your agenda and your light before us so that we will be guided, and not stumble over all the issues of the day, but instead mount each one as we rise up and become the great community we can be. Bless this group gathered here today. May their minds be open to you and to each other. May they truly lift up what's most important, the love of our children, the love that binds all. Lift our prayers to you in the name held most high. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible.
I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight and thank you for your kind words earlier. Um, I appreciate y'all taking your time on a Thursday night. Some of y'all, a lot of y'all have work it tomorrow. So thank you for being here. I'll remind you that tomorrow is the last day to early vote from 7 to 7. And then Tuesday is election day from 7 to 7. And conveniently, we can vote here. So as a district, we dedicate all our efforts and resources to our goal of high achievement for each student. The board uses this goal to guide all deliberations, decisions, and actions. You will get to see all deliberations, decisions, and actions of the board in open session, with the exception of some items which may be discussed in closed session, as stipulated in the Texas Government Code, Section 551, commonly known as the Open Meetings Law. These items typically deal with personnel matters, consultation with our attorney, and real estate. For the record, the following board members are present, Tara Herbacek, Sally Derrick, Randy Shackman, Candace Valenzuela, and myself. And we do constitute a quorum and may conduct business on behalf of the district. As required by board policy, BBD local, let the minutes reflect that all board members are well on the way to completing or exceeding the required hours of continued education for the current reporting period ending May 4th, 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, before moving on to the next agenda item, I would like to remind you that the board encourages comments from citizens of the district and from district employees. Anyone wishing to speak either as an individual or as a representative of a group may do so under agenda item number three, audience for guests. Please submit your request to do so on one of the items, one of the forms provided on the table outside the north entrance to the boardroom. You may place the completed form in the box provided on that table or present your completed form to Administrative Assistant Ms. Sharon Scribner. I believe you're wearing purple tonight. When the board addresses agenda item number three, you will be invited to the podium to speak to the board. So with that, we're going to get to kind of a more fun part of the board meeting. Dr. Chapman. Yes, uh, first of all, we'd like to thank all of you for being here tonight and, and, and most importantly to celebrate our excellent employees. And so we have uh, teachers and employees here that are representing our first nine weeks and they are elected by their staff and so as your name gets called up here please come up we want to give you an, a certificate and a gift of our appreciation and again thank you so much for what you do for our kids all of the employee and teachers of the nine weeks will be eligible for teacher and employee of the year which we will hold a banquet in May so thank you so much for being here tonight Dr. Chapman, Ms. Klein, and members of the board, I'm Lance Hamlin, the principal of Blaylock Middle School. We're here tonight to introduce you to our teacher of the first nine weeks, Mr. Matt Smith. <laughs> Mr. Smith has taught in CFB for the past 10 years, the last six at Blaylock Middle School, as an eighth grade social studies teacher, PBIS coordinator, instructional facilitator and induction year teacher mentor. There are many reasons that make him worthy of this recognition, but his ability to meet the students exactly where they are academically, emotionally, and socially allows him to have a positive impact on their overall personal growth. As a principal of Blaylock Middle School, I am grateful for all you do for our students and staff on a daily basis. You definitely make Blaylock a better place for all. Your dedication to CFB continues to change the lives of our students and adults every day. Thank you for what you do. Dr. Chapman, members of the board, friends and family, good evening. My name is Matt Warnock. I'm honored to serve as the principal at Barbara Bush Middle School, and I um, humbly ask for your help in recognizing Miss Lindsay Birchfield as our teacher of the nine weeks. I love my Broncos. <laughs> She serves as a sixth grade individuals and societies and IDS teacher, as well as our cheerleading coach. 
This is her eighth year on our campus and her third year in her classroom, previously serving our kiddos as a special education aide. She is CFB through and through, starting at Rosemead Elementary, then Blaylock, and she is a Creekview graduate and now a Barbara Bush Bronco. When asked for a single word explaining why she is deserving of the recognition, her peers eagerly shared words such as dedicated, caring, committed, driven, hardworking, smiling, bulletin boards, spirited, <laughs> passionate, and above and beyond, and most said they could go on and on. Mrs. Birchfield, thank you for choosing BBMS and CFB as your professional home. We are grateful you are with us. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, President Klein, members of the board. My name is Joe LaPuma, and I have the honor to be the principal at Creekview High School. I am also honored tonight to be able to introduce and recognize Mr. Shane DePaul as Creekview's teacher of the first nine weeks. <laughs> Coach DePaul currently teaches AP Human Geography, World Geography, and coaches varsity football and track. As a matter of fact, about 30 minutes ago, he was on one of the football fields with uh, the JV teams tonight, and we were doing very well. Uh, his experiences are vast, but his experiences doing mission work in Uganda, Guatemala, Russia, and other parts of the world allow him to bring re real world knowledge, critical thinking questions, and real world problems to his students. Shane is a relationship builder and is as, as dependable as they come. When you look up the ideal team player, his picture may very well be there. He is humble, hungry, and smart. Shane has had the opportunity on several occasions while at Creekview to step up and fill in when an opportunity or two has presented itself. And his reply is always, yes, of course, I'm glad to help. Most importantly, whether he is in the classroom or on the field of play, his work is done with the spirit of excellence. We're thankful to have Shane as part of our team and honored to be able to recognize him tonight as Creekview's teacher of the first nine weeks. Good evening, Superintendent Chapman, Board of Trustee members, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Timothy Isley. I serve as the principal at Early College High School. Uh, tonight, Shelma Dean Strawn is being recognized as the teacher of the nine weeks. <laughs> Ms. Strawn is a five-year math teacher, all of in the CFB, ISD, and ECHS assignments. Uh, this is her third year as department chair at our school. She's a mother of three, two of which are currently at Blaylock Middle School and are seeking enrollment at Early College High School. Most amazingly, most amazingly is the level of achievements that her students earn. She does this by cultivating and nurturing uh, relations with her students. Her Success Island classroom is based or founded upon respect, collaboration, and honor. With gratitude, I celebrate Shelma Dean Strawn, our teacher of the first nine weeks. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, Ms. Klein, members of the board, and guests in our audience. I'm here tonight to celebrate Coach Ashley Davidson with a few powerful words because she is a powerful person. 
Ashley is, takes the role of our dynamic learning project coach as well as a restorative circle facilitator. She is also CFB through and through. Ashley is in her sixth year in CFB in her ninth year in education. After coaching the Ranch View Wolves in basketball, she joined Vivian Field and she attended Country Place Elementary, Dan F. Long Middle School, and graduated from Newman Smith High School in 2002. Our staff was united on their vote for Ashley due to her gift of leadership, focus, and hard work. Ashley, it's an honor to call you our teacher of the first nine weeks. Good evening, Dr. Coleman and board members. I am Melissa Wesley, and it is my pleasure to be the principal of the Grimes Alternative Education Center this year. I'd like to present to you Ms. Mandy Parrish, our teacher of the first nine weeks. <laughs> Mandy has been in CFB for 10 years, first at Smith, and now this year moved with us to Grimes. She is one of the first FSW functional skills workshop teachers in the district, which serves our adult special education students, 18 to 22. She personalizes her relationships with the students, even with working with some students in their homes after school. And she does it with a smile, a big bow in her hair, and a lot of glitter. <laughs> it is for these reasons that we recognize Ms. Paris as the teacher of the first nine weeks for Grimes. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, President Klein, members of the board. My name is Sade Dockery, and I have the privilege of serving as a proud principal of Dan F. Long Middle School. Tonight, we honor Beth Lux as Dan F. Long's Teacher of the Nine Weeks. <laughs> Ms. Lux has been teaching at Long for seven years, where she is our wonderful fundamentals of language arts teacher and SPED team leader. Ms. Lux has a positive and infectious infectious personality. She is motivated to build relationships with all students and shares ideas with all staff to do so. Mrs. Lux says that she is proud of her strong connection to CFB. As, along with serving as a teacher in CFB, she and her, her husband owned a home in CFB district and both of their kids attend CFB schools. Also, her husband serves and supports the CFB community by owning and operating a thriving business in Carrollton as well. What she strives to do in her role, her why, is to be in a position to advocate for and support our students who need it most. Uh, besides, it, besides the amazing students at Long, one of the main reasons she loves it is because of the people and the team. Ms. Beth comes from a family of public servants. Uh, both of her parents are retired teachers, and her father is a retired lieutenant colonel from the Air Force. Um, so that's this explains why teaching is a work of heart for Ms. Lux, and we are glad that you chose CFB and Long as your home and family. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, President Klein, and members of the board. My name is Adam Toy, proud principal at the historic DeWitt Perry Middle School. <laughs> it is my honor to introduce to you Mrs. Temple Gonzalez Kramer as our teacher of the nine weeks. <laughs> A 
love our Perry family. <laughs> Temple has taught uh, for a total of 23 years, 20 of those at DeWitt Perry. Temple currently teaches writing and AVID and has served our campus in numerous leadership roles over the years. She's taught many students the love of reading and being successful. She's taught countless teachers the craft and how to teach with love and empathy. She's even taught me how to be a better assistant principal and principal. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please help me congratulate Mrs. Temple Gonzalez. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, President Klein, and members of the CFB School Board. It is my honor as principal of Ted Polk Middle School to honor tonight our teacher of the nine weeks, Mr. Richard Hyde. In his 13 years of service, Richard Hyde has remained dedicated to transforming the typical middle school experience into a mindset of becoming college ready, career ready, and future ready, changing the trajectory of thousands of student lives through his commitment to creating an avid culture whose influence has moved beyond the walls of Polk and CFB through the establishment of an avid national demonstration school. He has relationships that will last a lifetime for students and staff and his colleagues. That's why we're proud to call him our teacher of the first nine weeks. Good evening, everyone, and I am still Melissa Wesley, but I changed my hat and put on my Salazar hat as the principal of Salazar, Salazar Learning Center and would like to recognize Mr. Doug Luce as the Salazar teacher of the first nine weeks. <laughs> Doug has been the one and only, the main man high school math teacher at Salazar for the past 20 years. He was responsible for teaching every high school math course to students who came through DAP for the past 20 years. That's six preparations of high school math a day, every day for 20 years. Um, however, this year, he decided he might need a new challenge, so he said, hey, I think I'd like to move to middle school math. So he's probably <laughs> the only teacher in CFB who can say he has taught every grade level and math course offered in CFB, and it is for these reasons and more that he is recognized as our teacher of the first nine weeks. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, Mrs. Klein, and members of the board. My name is Brooke Hall, and it is my privilege to serve as the principal of R.L. Turner High School. Tonight, I'd like to introduce Turner's teacher of the nine weeks, Mr. Brian Henning. <laughs> Brian began his teaching career at Turner nine years ago. In that time, he's taught algebra, geometry, AQR, math models, and AP Calculus AB. 
Brian also currently serves on our advisory council. He says his favorite thing about teaching is the creative process of designing new ways for students to investigate and explore the content and creating problems that stretch their thinking. One of Brian's colleagues says, Brian is a great leader and teacher. He enjoys having fun and is always encouraging his students and colleagues to be delighted in the learning experience. His attitude and zest for teaching are contagious. Brian says, math is like a puzzle to me. I love how all the pieces fit together logically and are built off of each other. Mr. Henning at Turner, you're an important piece of our Turner family and we thank you for your dedication to our students and our school. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, Ms. Klein, and school board members. My name is Shanaj Ahmad, principal of Ari Good Ivy World School, and I'm honored to be here this evening to recognize Ms. Wendolyn Kay as our first nine weeks employee of the year. <laughs> All of us here can think of the hardest working person in our building. And for us at the Gator Swamp, that person is hands down our amazing custodian, Miss Kay. Right now is actually the longest we have ever seen her stand still. <laughs> it's said that an ant can carry about 50 times its weight while moving upwards of 30 miles per hour. And when you look at Miss Kay and her small stature, you would never guess that just like an ant, she can do the same. Now, the weight that she carries does not only come in the form of desks, chairs, and bookshelves. This weight also comes in the form of love, care, and responsibility for our little gators. At the Gator Swamp, we have a mantra, every gator is my gator. Miss K exemplifies this mantra to the highest degree. Even in her constant flurry of movement, she always has time to find out why a kindergartner is having a tough morning or welcome a new student who looks a little lost at their new school. Teachers love Miss K also, because she has a hard time saying no to a, could we maybe move that bookshelf over there request? And she doesn't get upset when that glitter project really wasn't such a good idea after all. <laughs> there is an old saying, the way you do something is the way you do everything. Thank you Miss K for being so selfless in everything you do. You are truly the hardest working person that has ever walked the halls of Good Elementary, and we are so honored to celebrate you tonight. Dr. Chapman, members of the board and guests, I'm Rochelle Sharon, Director of Student Nutrition, and tonight I have the distinct privilege to recognize Student Nutrition's Employee of the Nine Weeks, Mona Nowlin. <laughs> Mona and her husband, Leon, are deeply rooted in our community as Carol of, of Carrollton, as that's been their family home for 31 years. In addition, her children, Jeremy and Kelly, were students at Furneaux, Long, Blaylack, before graduating both from Newman Smith High School. Mona joined our student nutrition family in 1990 and for the past 28 years has been making a significant contribution to our district. She began her career in the cafeteria at McCoy and Creekview. Clearly, her leadership qualities rose to the top and were apparent as she became the manager of Davis Elementary School. And only after a couple of years was promoted again to her current position of field supervisor for the student nutrition department. In that position, Mona serves as a liaison between the student nutrition office and 12 of our district cafeterias. Mona is a true department leader 
as she maintains open lines of communication with all, utilizes sound judgment, and mentors approximately 70 cafeteria staff on customer service, time management, and additional in addition to all the technical aspects of the Federal Meals Program and provides instruction for not only quantity but quality food preparation. Mona holds her cafeterias and staff to the highest standards and it shows in their performance. Monthly district cafeterias are measured against eight operational benchmarks. Clearly, Mona is not scared of a little friendly competition. Under Mona's leadership, her cafeterias collectively outperformed the other supervisors in the areas of participation, food cost, inventory management, health inspection scores, cash handling, external regulatory audit scores, and the general financial health of the operations. For the past 15 years, I've had the honor of working closely with Mona, and I can tell you her dedication to the district and the students of CFB is second to none. We're delighted to have Mona as a member of our student nutrition family, and she is a great asset to the CFB team. Join me in honoring Mona Nallen. Good evening once again, Dr. Chapman, members of the board. What an honor and privilege it is tonight to be able to recognize Mrs. Ronnell Eddings, who was selected as the Texas Dance Educators Association Dance Teacher of the Year. Ms. Eddings has been a Creekview Mustang for the past 16 years of her 25-year dance education uh, career. She has been a champion of dance education across the district, and I think we see across all levels how that is working out, and it's working out just great. She has taken our students across the, the United States, from Pittsburgh to Florida, many cities in Texas and to the West Coast, to help those students learn and participate in the in dance education. Ronnell will represent CFB and Creekview in Houston at a recognition luncheon in January when TDEA has their state convention. She's done an incredible job as an educator and advocate for dance education of course at Creekview High School and across the state for her peers. This recognition shows just what a powerful impact that she is having not only in our community but across the great state of Texas. As our fine arts department manager, as a part of our leadership team, and who a, a very important person who helps Creekview create a caring community, I cannot be more proud of Ronnell and of TDA for making a great selection. So I would like to say congratulations, and I would like to thank you for all you do. Congratulations, Ms. Eddings. At this time, we'll go over district announcements. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm excited to say we have some great news to share. Congratulations to the Lady Trojans, Lady Lions, and Lady Wolves for their winning season as bi-district volleyball champs. Smith and Turner are playing their area round tonight at the playoff games, and Ranchview plays tomorrow night at 5.30. So the playoff outcomes will be posted on our district website, and please be sure to check our social media for the outcomes. In other news, our high school stellar academies are visiting our eighth grade students starting tomorrow, Friday, November 2nd, and will continue for two weeks to share all the awesome opportunities CFB high schools have to offer. 
Find out complete Academy information and the parent open house events at www.cfbacademies.com. This is an exciting time for fine arts in our CFB high schools. Creekview Fine Arts kicks off their production of The Little Mermaid on November 14th. On December 14th and 15th, Ranchview High School will perform Shrek the Musical Junior. And in January, see Newman Smith High School's production of Legally Blonde. Also in January, Turner will perform Guys and Dolls. Find ticket information and performance times at www.cfbfinearts.com. On November 6, 2018, CFB will hold a bond election for $350 million, including reno renovations and improvements to all campuses, safety and security, career and technical education improvements, fine arts improvements, athletic improvements, and technology infrastructure. There will be no cost to taxpayers as a result for the November 6, 2018 election. For more information, visit the Bond website at www.cfbbond.com. Now I would like to invite Council PTA Representative Sylvia Mansuera to give an update on PTA. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sylvia Mansuera and I serve as third VP programs of family engagement for the Council PTA. I am pleased to report that 31 of our 36 PTAs are in active and good standing with Texas PTA. A lot of steps and effort goes into that process, so our lo local PTA should be commended for those efforts. Our current membership count is at 4,544 members, which means we're about 70% to our membership goal this year of just over 6,700 members. Our local PTAs continue to promote membership to our families and community. Anyone can join PTA. You can easily go to joinpta.org and select the PTA that you would like to join. We encourage everybody in the community to join at least one or more PTAs. Membership counts as we move into the Texas legislative session in 2019. Texas PTA uses our voices to advocate to our state legislature. Remember, every child, every child one voice. Additionally, Texas PTA provides fre frequent legislative updates to our members through their advocacy committee regarding when action is needed to voice support for opposition, to voice support or opposition, sorry, to bills impacting public education. Membership matters. The National PTA Art Contest Reflections is underway. The theme this year is Heroes Around Us, and we are excited to report that we have 29 schools participating in Reflections this year. Local schools will advance their entries to council PTA and council judging will take place in early December of this year. Awarded entries from CFB council PTA will advance to Texas PTA and hopefully we will have entries advancing past that to national PTA. Remember our reflection ceremony will be January 16 of 2019 at 6 p.m. at Newman Smith Auditorium and this ceremony is open to the public. At our last council meeting, CFB Council PTA passed a statement in support of the upcoming CFB ISD bond referendum. To do so, each local PTA had to have a meeting for their members to approve that statement and authorize the vote at the council level. We would like to commend our local PTAs for their efforts. It is not an easy task. This effort is the core of our PTA's mission, advocacy, and we are proud that our local PTAs work to make this happen. Together with the CFB Parent Education Committee, Council PTA is hosting our next parent education event titled Digital Kids Parenting in the Age of Smartphones on November 7th from 7.50 a.m. to 8.50 a.m. It's going to be a live presentation at Stark Elementary and for the first time we will live stream it. You can watch the live stream on your personal device or at one of our watching parties at Country Place, Las Colinas or Rainwater Elementary and Spanish interpretation is available at Stark only. As we near Thanksgiving, we would like to express our thanks to principals, local PTA leaders, and our local PTA volunteers that keep things moving at our campuses. We are so very thankful for the PTA community within CFB. We are thankful to our CFB PTA members for their support, and we are thankful to the district for your continued support and partnership with PTA. We are lucky to have such an engagement from the district at all levels, and we know that support allows us to focus on our mutual goal of high achievement for each student. Thank you.
thank you, Sylvia, and the other PTA officers for what you do to support our students and staff. Thank you to the campuses and the principals for introducing us to your teachers of the first nine weeks. We love hearing their stories. Some I've known for a while, some I don't know, and I love hearing how passionate you are and how giving you are of your time and your talents. Um, Ms. Eddings, congratulations on your well-deserved recognition of all the things that you have been doing for years for our students. We're very fortunate. And with that, you know, I just don't want to make myself cry, so I'm going to go ahead and we're going <laughs> to take a brief recess. It's 739, so we're going to take a brief recess for the next 10 minutes, and we will begin with the audience for guests when we come back. Thank you all. This meeting of the Carrollton Farmers Ranch ISD Board of Trustees is called back to order at 7.52 p.m. The next item on the agenda is audience for guests. Ms. Scrivener, are there any audience for guests tonight? No, ma'am. Thank you. There are no speakers for tonight's meeting. We will proceed to the next agenda item, number four, consent agenda. The consent agenda is a mechanism that the board uses to approve a number of routine items together with a single vote. In compliance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, the public notice for this meeting includes the list of all consent agenda items, and the board has been provided ample information about these items in advance. Prior to any action taken on the consent agenda, board members may request withdrawal of individual items for clarification or discussion. Board members, are there any items to be removed from the consent agenda at this time? Uh, in earlier consultation, I had suggested that I would pull item 4D after having a chance to find a couple of additional pieces of information and an agenda item for the future. I'm going to go ahead and leave it in the consent agenda. Okay, thank you, Mr. Shackman. Board members, anything else to be removed from the consent agenda? So... No, I know. I'm, I'm just looking at them. Are you looking for a uh, motion? Yes. Um, I move that we approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Ms. Ravatic. Uh, Ms. Fonzuela? Thank you. With that, is there any discussion about the consent agenda? Uh, I have a few comments that I'd like to uh, make. One of the items in uh, our consent agenda, if you reviewed um, that packet, was our the approval of our campus um, improvement plans that the campus improvement councils um, committees put together. And since there's a few principles left here, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the efforts on uh, increasing parent and community participation uh, in those committees and those councils uh, to collaborate with your staff. I think it's a really great way to showcase the good things, great things happening in your schools and in our district. And so um, in my analysis, 31 schools had an increase in non-staff participation. Uh, and of those, nine of those schools did it with an increase in staff participation and eight with no change in staff participation. So that's just really impressive. And uh, along that, the schools with the uh, most uh, non-staff participation, River Chase, Davis, Good, and Las Colinas, I just think it highlights um, the efforts in promoting the collaboration between our community and our families um, and assists in spreading the word. So um, thank you for that effort. Thank you, Ms. Herbacek. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. With a vote of five in favor and zero opposed, the motion carries. Thank you. Number five, non-action items for discussion and consideration. And 5A, report on the school first financial integrity rating system of Texas 2017-2018 rating based upon school year 2016-17 data, including financial management report. Mr. Good, good evening. Um, we are here to present the results of the 2017-18 uh, school first ratings. The ratings are based on data from the 16-17 school year. The primary goal of the school first reporting system is to identify school districts that achieve quality performance in the management of school district's financial resources. There are two reporting requirements for the fir school first. 
the district must prepare and distribute an annual financial management report, and the district must also hold a public hearing to provide opportunity for comment on the report. The Texas Education the Texas Education Agency plans to make major changes to the school first rating system with the 20, 20, 20, 2021 report for the 1920 data. Um, we have just completed some changes from the last couple of years, and so we will keep you up to date on those expected changes um, and how those will be phased in. Our report tonight, the 1718 report, has three types of indicators critical, solvency, financial, and financial competence. The rating will be issued with either an A superior. B above standard, C meet standards, or F sub substandard achievement. Last year's report contained a total of 15 indicators with either A, B, C, or F rating. Uh, to receive the highest rating, a school district must answer yes to all five critical indicators as well as accumulate between 90 and 100, 100 points on the remaining 10 indicators. For the current year, for the current year's school first rating, a system will there will be no changes to the 15 indicators or the points totals received for the highest grade of A. For the 2017-18 school first report, Carrollton Farmers Branch received a rating of A for superior. The district answered yes to all critical indicators and had a total point accumulation of 100 points for indicators 6 through 15. Last year's 16-17 report, the district received a rating of A for superior and answered yes to all critical indicators and had a point total of 100 for the remaining indicators. For the current ratings of the 1,022 school districts, 836 districts received an A rating, 117 received B, 64 districts received the C rating, and only five received an F rating. These are the first three critical indicators. Uh, the first column represents the descriptions from the 1718 report, and the second column represents uh, the description of the in indicators from last year's report. And the last two columns to the far right represent the point total received on each question. The district passed all three of the critical indicators listed. These are the two remaining critical indicators. As mentioned previously, these indicators for this uh, current report are the same as last year. Uh, an example is number four. It asked, did the school district make timely payments to the Texas Teacher Retirement System? Texas Workforce Commission, Internal Revenue, Internal Revenue Service, and other governmental agencies. The district did make all timely payments to these entities. And the district passed uh, the other critical indicators as presented. Uh, these are the solvency indicators. Uh, there are seven indicators in this section. Uh, we won't go over each one, but to give you an example is number six. Uh, it states, was the number of days of cash on hand and current investments and the general fund for the school district is sufficient to cover operating expenditures. Uh, the result of the indicator is the district could go 144 days to cover operating expenses and we received a 10 points, the most available for this question. Uh, the final group of indicators is the financial competence section. An example is number 13. It states, did the comparison of PEAMS data to like information in the district's annual financial report result in a total variance of less than 3% of all expenditures. Uh, the district's total variance was less than 3%, so the district received the highest point total for this question. Uh, the school first also requires other disclosures, including a copy of the superintendent's current employment contract. This is included in the district's management report, a schedule of total reimbursements received by the superintendent and each board member during the 2016-17 fiscal year, this is also included in the management report. Uh, schedule of outside compensation and or fees received by the superintendent in exchange for pro professional consulting and or other personal services. Uh, the superintendent did not receive any such compensation. A schedule of a total dollar amount of gifts that were received by the superintendent and board members that had an economic value of $250 or more. Uh, there were none. And the summary schedule of a dollar amount by board members for the aggregate amount of business transactions with the school district, and there were no such transactions. Uh, this slide is a summary of reimbursements received by the superintendent and school board members during the 2016-17 fiscal year. And the district will meet all the school first reporting re requirements upon the conclusion of the public hearing. Uh, the 2017-18 school first management report is also available upon request. 
Uh, this concludes our 1718 school first report. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Roger. So board members, are there any questions? I just wanted to say that integrity really does define what I feel about our financial management that is operating in our school district. And I appreciate Dr. Chapman, Ms. Tillman, Mr. Roderick, and your staff for the work that you do to keep us above all reproach. So thank you. With that, I'll move to 6B. Oh, 5B. Public hearing on the School First Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas 2017-18 rating based upon school year 2016-17 data, including financial report financial management report. Ladies and gentlemen, you understood from Mr. Roderick this is required as part of what we are expected to do annually. And so I call this public hearing about the 2017-18 school first rating to order at 8.02 p.m. The board now will hear comments from the audience. Please indicate your intent to speak by raising your hand and then I'll recognize you and you can come to the podium. Is there anyone wishing to speak on the school first item 5B? If there are no speakers, the public hearing about School First is closed at 8.02 p.m. So the next agenda item is number six, unless board members want to say anything about 5B or 5A. We're good. Um, item number six, consider all matters 6B. Since there were no items removed from consent, we have no 6A. 6B, consider all matters related to renovations of the Newman Smith High School front entrance, including declaring the construction delivery method, approval of evaluation criteria and relative weight of each criterion, and delegation of authority to receive and evaluate proposals. Ms. Tillman and Mr. Finley. Yes, and, and, and board, what I want to say is I sent you the design for Newman Smith uh, probably a month ago, and so that's one of the pieces that Mr. Finley is going to speak on tonight. Thank you, Dr. Chapman, Ms. Klein, board members. Last January, we presented to the board a concept for front entrance enhancements at Newman Smith High School, and we are now ready to move forward with this project. After discussion with the design team and the architects, it was determined that the, to provide the best value for the district, a competitive sealed proposal was the most appropriate procurement method for a project of this size and nature. As a reminder, a competitive sealed proposal is a project delivery method that's approved that schools can use. Where, they re where we request proposals and pricing information based on the scope of work, and then the district ranks the proposal and negotiates a final contract with that contractor. At this time, we are recommending to the Board of Trustees approval for the resolution for de delegation of authority <coughs> as presented, declare the construction delivery method as competitive sealed proposal, and approve the evaluation criteria and weighted value of each criterion. So board members, this is an action item. Mr. Shackman? Ms. Klein, I will move that we accept the recommendation of the administration to move forward with the uh, renovations at Newman Smith High School as proposed. Thank you. We have a motion by Mr. Shackman. A second by Ms. Valenzuela. Do we have any discussion with that? Um, all those in favor, please raise your hand. That is with a vote of five in favor and zero opposed, the motion carries. So this takes us to item number 6C. Consider all matters related to exterior improvements to Blair Farmers Branch and Stark Elementary Schools and Vivian Field Middle School, including declaring the construction delivery method, approval of evaluation criteria, and relative weight of each criteria and delegation of authority. Dr. Chapman? Yes, then. Mr. Finley will continue on with the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Likewise, language in the Farmers Branch Tax Increment Finance Zone allows for funding for to be used for exterior improvements at schools located in the Farmers Branch TIF Zone. And these improvements actually can include playground equipment. So we are currently finalizing the plans and specifications for small projects at Blair, Farmers Branch, and Stark Elementary Schools, as well as Vivian Field Middle School. All of the landscaping work for each project will be located at the main entrance, main front entrance of each school. 
And we are specifically designing these projects to enhance the campus curb appeal at, as well as address needs identified in the facility and security assessments. We are also including new playgrounds and coverings at Blair Elementary and Farmers Branch Elementary. Stark, by the way, has new equipment and coverings. And as was the case with the Newman Smith project, it was determined that the competitive sealed proposal delivery method best suited projects of this nature. Therefore, we are recommending the Board of Trustees approve the resolution for delegation of authority as presented, declare the construction delivery method as competitive sealed proposals, and approve the evaluation criteria and weighted value of each criterion. Thank you, Mr. Finley. Board members? Ms. Klein? Uh, I move that uh, the board approve the resolution, resolution for delegation of authority presented, declare the construction delivery method as competitive sealed proposal, and approve the evaluation criteria and weighted value of each criterion. Thank you for your motion. Ms. Derricks, thank you for your second. Is there any discussion on this item? I would just ask what is the estimated amount expected? The, the cost? Uh huh. 750000 Okay. Thank you. Um, all board members will, will vote with no more discussion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. With a vote of five in favor and zero opposed, the motion carries. Thank you, board members. Thank so you. this brings us to item number 6D consider approval of proposed resolution regarding participation and expenditure of funds for community and civic events. Do you mind giving us a yes, brief explanation? I sure will. So uh, a couple months ago, uh, an issue arose, and it was brought to our attention by the public that we are using public funds to uh, sponsor and or support civic and community events. Therefore, we reached out to our attorneys, and you, you're, able, you're able to do so, but the Board of Trustees would have to pass a resolution allowing the use of public funds for such events. In turn, there's a three-way step process that must be used according to the AG rules. And so in the resolution, it states those three. You have to have some return, example. So if we were to sponsor or support uh, an organization through um, an organization for a scholarship, then in turn, we get something back in return for that. So uh, for us to be able to continue to do this, which I do support, we need to uh, the Board of Trust needs to be, cons they need to consider the resolution that's in front of them. But I want to address one thing. If you can look on three, item number three on the second page, and it says expenditures may be made in a reasonable amount in attendance and participation in said events and not to exceed. And then we have to fill that in. Our average per year for the district alone is 25000 There's roughly another 5000 that's based on the campus level. But here's the question that, I, that I'm going to present to you. It says, for the 18, 19, and 1920 school year, so if we go with this version, then we need to double that amount. So if we're saying it's 25,000, that in turn means 50. If we're saying 30, it needs to be 60. Or I have another uh, attachment here that has the language within it, but it just says for each year. So if you would like to use that, or just says each year and you have a blanket, 25 or 30,000, then we won't have to return every year on that item. But it would be up to the Board of Trustees. So we can either do a two year, double that amount, or I'll give you a different resolution to where it's just for each school year. That's so, number three. So thank you, Dr. Chapman. Mm -hmm. Board members, do you have any questions or discussion on this item? You also have a list of all the uh, donations over the course of the last year, which is also the average. If you look um, on the paper clipped item, you can see the attachment A, and you can see those, those come up to $25,060. Mr. Shackman. Um, Ms. Klein, as I was looking over the list and the organizations and things that we have participated in, uh, uh, since you and I, I guess are the senior members here of the uh, the board here tonight. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm older than you, so <laughs> uh, it it seems to me that we get great uh, return on investment, if you will, in supporting these organizations. I think we have been judicious in the ones that we select. 
uh, and that the return in scholarships and the return in support programs and uh, enrichment for students and things, it, it's a great opportunity. And I'm personally very supportive of it. I would like to suggest that probably we just use the each school year. And my thought process is that we would go slightly above the 30,000 per year so that if there are, if we're looking at any sponsorships for the next year and if there's a slight increase, we don't have to come back to the board to pick up a resolution for $500 or something like that. So that would be my thought board and I'll listen to your thought process on that. And I would ask what time of year is the best time of year to make this resolution? Well, if you, if you go with the each year, it's a one-time deal and you're done. If you do it every year. Is it year, a calendar it, year or a Yes, budget? July. So it's, it's listed here. So you have July 1st through June 30th. And so if it were my recommendation, if, we were, if you want to do this you every year. You wouldn't do November? No, ma'am. No, okay. That's no. what I was asking. Yes, you would not <laughs> want to do November. But this arose in August, yeah. September, and it had to right. be done before we could move forward with any Where I'm going is I would recommend a two-year this time. Okay. Because we're off cycle, right? And then we get with cycle so that we can do it in the summer before the school year. Okay. So would that mean you'd have to? Uh, would that mean you'd have to return to amend? Yes. Um, okay. You would. Mm -hmm. Okay. You would have to come back and pass another resolution. Yes. If I did a year and a half, mm -hmm. or two year. If you just do each year of. If he's like like uh, Mr. Chapman said, if you just do each year of thirty thousand dollars, well then it, it starts over again on July one, and so it's just it's it's continuous. Oh. So you're okay, okay. with the sake of we're not going to spend that much obviously this year being in November, and then when it doesn't have to be revisited by the board each year. Do we meet in July? Traditionally, we don't. No, we don't. Oh. No. So, I mean, I'm just thinking through. This is how my mind works. So. so, if you pass, like Mr. Shatman recommended, you do not have to pass a resolution again. Oh, you want to do the two year each year? So, if we say each year, then that means that you give us a maximum of thirty thousand so each year for two the years. next until Perfect. you address it. No, forever. Perfect. Forever. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That. And then it would be up to y'all to let us know or the yes. future board that if there was situations where the um, sponsorship if, amounts or the contribution amounts were increasing. Yes, yeah, so requests. if it had to increase, and let's say that we started spending and, and it was for a good cause, 33000 then we would then come back come with back. a resolution amending that to thirty-three. Okay. So how in our current budget if we pass the resolution for this amount uh, i mean how is that in a line com it's community engagement right or how is it written community support community engagement by doing so are are we going to see an amendment in the budget no from this okay. no because we, we, we we've been spending this for years okay this and, amount mm -hmm. the, okay i think this is just getting in line with formalizing what is expected Legalities. by the state yes yeah. okay this is so Mr. Roderick can have another hundred on his, his next year's school first. <laughs> but the, so the big question is dollar amount, and do you want to go for the two year, or do you just want to say for each year, and then you don't have to go through this resolution again? If you do, each year, then I give you this. The one you have in your hand is for the eighteen nineteen, the nineteen twenty school year. So those are two questions: dollar amount, and then. One time, you're good every year, or do you want to reevaluate in two years? So I guess board members, dollar amount. Let's tackle that first. So a slight question: What were you thinking, 2004? So you, so right now we spent at a district level about twenty-five thousand sixty dollars, and then roughly on a campus level another about five. five. Yeah. So I was I, so over and above that. I mean the. Thirty thousand. I mean, it's like thirty-two thousand. How about thirty-two or thirty-three thousand? Would that be yes something it's, palatable? It's sufficient. Okay. So I see heads nodding. So we're going to think that thirty-two or thirty-three. Would you like to pick one, Miss Valenzuela? I'll go with thirty-two. Okay. And then, um, then which resolution do we want to do? Each, each year, year or 
each year. Yeah. So we'll need that sample wording. I, I can read it. And um, and we'll need to read it out loud, Mr. Shackman. Oh boy. So would you like to move that while you read it? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Scrimmer, I dare you. <laughs> um, I will make a motion that we adopt the following resolution as the Carrollton Farmers Branch ISD Board. On the first day of November 2018, the Board of Trustees of the Carrollton Farmers Branch School District adopted by vote the following findings and resolutions. Whereas CFBISD is committed to community involvement and building partnerships with community, business and governmental leaders to influence and expand educational opportunities to meet the needs of students. Whereas CFBISD desires to foster an ongoing positive relationship with other entities, including community civic organizations, which support CFBISD, its staff and students. Whereas CFBISD has always been and will remain committed to providing the best possible educational opportunities and support for its students while at the same time being good stewards of available public funds. Whereas CFBISD has frequent opportunities to attend and participate in events sponsored by community and civic organizations that have a school related purpose and benefit CFBISD, its staff and its students, including events to honor CFBISD students and staff and events to raise funds for scholarships for CFBISD students. It goes on. <laughs> Whereas admission or participation fees and costs are often associated with attendance and participation in events sponsored by community and civic organizations, Whereas the district has explored the costs and benefits of supporting community and civic organizations, including attending and participating in events that have a school related purpose and benefit to CFBISD. Whereas the district has determined that there is a benefit to the district and a legitimate pr a public and school related purpose in supporting those entities, including payment of admission or participation fees and costs for trustees and school personnel, personnel to attend these events, and whereas in the best interest of CFBISD for the appropriate public purposes and in an effort to foster and promote relationships with entities that provide rec recognition and support to CFBISD, its staff and students, the Board of Trustees for CFBISD should participate and engage in activities and events sponsored by those entities which have a school-related purpose. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees for the 2018-2019 and 2019-2020 school year has determined that that should be J. That's, yeah, yeah that's, that's school year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It should read, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Trustees for Carrollton Farmers Branch Independent School District has determined that the findings and recitals in the preamble of this resolution are hereby found to be true and correct and are hereby approved and incorporated into and made part of this resolution to a public purpose and a benefit to the Carrollton Farmers Branch Independent School District exists in expending funds to support community and civic organizations by expending funds for admission and participation costs and fees associated with attendance by trustees and district personnel where the event has a school related purpose and will benefit CFBISD including its staff and or students. Three, expenditures may be made in a reasonable amount for attendance and participation in said events not to exceed $32,000 each school year, July 1 through June 30. Four, the Carrollton Farmers Branch ISD will receive value by the expenditure of funds as reflected herein because said expenditures will serve to support and help facilitate the district's commitment to build partnerships 
within the community and to serve the needs of public school students in the community, and five, reasonably adequate controls are in place to ensure that such benefits and value are received by the district as the associate superintendent of finance will review and evaluate each event to ensure a school related purpose and to ensure that the expenditures are reasonable and do not exceed the total set forth herein. Be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution shall be placed in the minutes of the Carrollton Farmers Branch ISD Board of Trustees minutes. Be it further resolved and declared that it a sufficient written notice of the date, time, place, and subject of the meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Carrollton Farmers Branch ISD at which this resolution was adopted was posted at a place convenient and readily accessible at all times to the general public for the time required by law preceding this meeting as required by Chapter 551 Texas Government Code and that this meeting has been open to the public as required by law at all times during which this resolution and the subject matter thereof have been discussed, considered, and formally acted upon. The Board of Trustees further ratifies, approves, and confirms each such written notice and posting thereof. Be it further resolved that the superintendent shall take all actions necessary and appropriate to implement this resolution in consultation with the board. Done. Thank you, Thank you sincerely, Mr. Shackman, <laughs> for your motion on this item. Thank you, Mr. Bacic, for your second. Um, we have a motion and a second. Is there any Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. With a vote of five in favor and zero opposed, the motion carries. Our next agenda item is item number seven, closed meeting is authorized under Texas Government Code, including but not limited to section 551-071, consultation with attorney, 551-072, real property, 551-074, personnel matters, 551076 security devices, 551082 school children district employees disciplinary matter or complaint, 551021 personally identifiable student information, 551.084 investigation. The specific topic for board deliberation and closed set meeting is item 7A pursuant to Texas government code 551.076 discussion and deliberation regarding security and safety. Audience members are welcome to remain in the boardroom as board members recess and move to another room, the executive conference room number 150 for deliberations. The time now is 8.24 p.m. We are back on the record in open session having returned from closed session. The time is now 10.45 p.m. Our next agenda item is number eight, reconvene an open meeting for possible action regarding items discussed in closed meeting. Board members, is there any action to take regarding items discussed in closed meeting? So um, we have item 8A, consider approval to authorize the superintendent to research and or provide more information. No? Okay. So number nine. Comments from board members regarding posted agenda items. Board members, do you have any comments you want to make at this time? Yes. Well, I just want to comment that it was a really good week in CFB. I mean, when I have to choose activities every night that aren't my own kids' activities that I kind of have to go to, that to go see, I consider that um, a win. The most exciting being the uh, Newman Smith Halloween baseball watching the dinosaur run down the first baseline. So, um, but with the volleyball playoffs and basketball scrimmages and the football games, um, choices all around. So it's exciting. Thank you, Tara. Any other comments? So ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the end of our agenda and we are adjourned at 10.47 p.m.